If you have a thoroughbred or are thinking of adding one to your farm, listen in as we talk with Kristen Werner about the Thoroughbred Incentive Program. Kristen serves as a senior counsel for the Jockey Club. She is involved with the Jockey Club's industry initiatives related to racing integrity, the welfare and safety of the racehorse, and aftercare. In this episode, we dive into what the program is all about. How did you get started with horses? So, um, my background is not necessarily horsey. My sister invented growing up. I played sports and showed dogs, but always kind of rode horses. Um, but when I was at UK for college, I applied for a part-time job at the jockey club doing data entry. Um, so I've actually worked for the jockey club since I was 18 hmm. or 19, I guess, um, years old. So it's almost, um, what year is this now? 20, 22 years now I've been there, um, mm-hmm. in one position or another. So I worked for them all through college and law school. And then, um, now work for them full time. My title is senior counsel, but um, I do some legal work. And then I also work in what we call industry initiatives, which are um, our programs that are designed to help with the welfare and safety of of racehorses, as well as racehorses retiring from racing, which is um, how I ended up creating the thoroughbred incentive program. Um, On a personal level, I do have two horses now in my backyard. I got to fulfill my childhood dream of having horses um, at my house. So I've got one retired thoroughbred and one that's probably a thoroughbred that used to be a therapeutic riding horse. So, Very cool. And for our listeners who don't know, can you give us a little bit of background on uh, the Jockey Club? Sure. So the Jockey Club is the breed registry for thoroughbred race horses and all thoroughbreds. So we are the registering organization you know, similar to an AQHA or an APHA for those breeds. Um, We're just called the Jockey Club instead of something with sort of thoroughbred in the name. Um, We also have a number of for-profit companies and uh, two not-for-profit charitable organizations that are sort of part of our umbrella of companies. Um, Our for-profit organizations are mostly related to data and technology. And then our not-for-profits, one is for equine research, that's Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation. And then one is for sort of the the people side of of the racing industry, and that's the Jockey Club Safety Net Foundation. And then the Thoroughbred Incentive Program is just a part of the Jockey Club. Um, And so we uh, not only have our our own internal aftercare programs like TIP, but we also support some aftercare programs like the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance and Thoroughbred Charities of America in addition to our own kind of in-house um, aftercare program. So when you went to law school, were you intending to continue to work for the Jockey Club or were you <laughs> wanting to go, like, how did that work? Did you want to go corporate or? So when I went, I, I'll back up to give you a little bit of the background. When I started college, I wanted to be an archeologist um, and I changed oh my, my mind and decided <laughs> to go to law school. Wow. Um, so I, um, Really, when I was in law school, what I thought was that I would probably focus more on the criminal side, like prosecution mm-hmm. side. But sort of through happenstance, a girl that worked at the jockey club unfortunately got into a car accident. She's fine now, so it worked out okay. But they needed someone to come back and work part time um, to kind of cover her, so they called me. So I, I actually stopped kind of working for them, and then I went back again. Um, and then I was very fortunate that they saw something in me mm-hmm. uh, that they wanted to keep me on. So they created an internship for me. And then when I graduated from law school, a a full-time job. Um, And so I started um, sort of in an administrative and legal role. And then as time has gone on, I've grown uh, in that role. And then we've added some additional programs, um, the industry initiative side. And then of course, all the aftercare programs have been created in the last 10 or 11 years. Um, That was something that wasn't really done before then. Um, and so I was glad to be able to be a part of that because ultimately I love horses. Mm -hmm. Racing is where my job is and I've always liked horse racing, but, um, being able to support the efforts to make sure that thoroughbreds are getting a good home when they're done and, Mm -hmm. and that they can go on to do other really cool things like eventing or therapeutic riding work. Um, that's sort of where my passion lies. So I'm very lucky that I can combine both what I went to school for, as well as kind of what I always loved as a kid growing up, you know, when I had all my briar horses and stuff, you know, and I didn't have the real ones. I had the briar ones and they all had names and pedigrees and all kinds of things. So <laughs> I guess it, it was a little bit foretelling that then I end up working for the stud book. So, <laughs> wow. um, so what do you, do you ride now and do you have a discipline that you ride? 
So I, my one horse, well, both my horses, the one's pretty much retired. The other one, um, I really just do trail riding and casual riding with. Um, I'd love to be able to take them out and go cool places like, you know, Montana or, or Wyoming and stuff and do trail riding out there. Maybe someday right now we're just kind of sticking around here. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I enjoy caring for them a lot and I wish I had more time to ride. Um, but definitely not, my horses are young enough. the one horse is young enough that there's still time to do that. So it's very cool. I think it's incredible that you were able to find like to go with your passion after college, because I think um, for equestrians, it would be very tough to go into um, the law world and not have mm. the yeah. opportunity to still, you know, work with horses every single day. We've talked to a couple lawyers mm -hmm. um, in the past, and they've all said like they missed their horses when they were working the full time job. So I think it's really cool that you're able to immediately get into the field um, right outside of college. Yeah, for sure. And being in Kentucky certainly helps. Um, but, you know, what I always tell people who are interested in getting into specifically thoroughbreds or horse racing is, you know, take a job, even if it's a data entry job, like I did, you know, the first very first thing I was doing was entering pedigrees into the database. So I mean, it was straight data entry. Um, but it got my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the biggest way to kind of get immersed into the industry because it's not it may not be the most glamorous job but it does open those doors to maybe the other things that you might want to do and whether it's actually working with horses hands-on or or working in an office but it gives you the opportunity to, to be involved in racing um, I think just even taking a job to support the industry whether it's thoroughbreds or, or other breeds is is probably the best way to start how much in your particular job are you actually around the horses? Are you behind the desk more or so, or do you get to be around the horses often? Sadly, my horses are the only ones that I'm really around on a regular basis. Now, that's changing a little bit where uh, we now, we, Thoroughbred Incentive Program, have um, two horse shows that we're doing this year. Um, we call them the tip championships. So in October this year, I will actually kind of get to be immersed in the real life, seeing the horses and seeing all the cool things that thoroughbreds are doing. But no, generally my job is is behind the desk. Um, I, I love to get out to the horse shows when I can, um, but I'm more, uh, I, I'm around a lot more horse show ribbons than I am the actual horses. <laughs> so um, I do love the championship. So getting to see the horses and meet the people that I you know talk to on email or see posting about their horses and all that stuff mm -hmm. is, is really fun and very rewarding part of the job. So these programs that you started, um, were, were they your idea or was it a group effort to start them? How did those come to be? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, back in, I probably around 2010 or so, what we now call aftercare, which at that time, it wasn't really even a word, but it was essentially, we have all these thoroughbreds that are retiring from racing and we know that they can do all kinds of stuff. They can be eventers. We've seen that they can be, you know, Olympic jumpers and everything mm -hmm. else. And so we, as the jockey club breed registry, um, our bosses who were governed by a board of stewards thought it was really important that we start taking a leadership role in that area. So, um, I had always, as I said, been very passionate about that side of it. I love racing, but I love horses more. And, and I was more involved through my sister and just through things in general with sort of the sport horse side. So I kind of took that and ran with it, I guess, a little bit. And so we created between like 2010 and 2013, there were a few programs that the Jockey Club created. And then there were a few programs that the Jockey Club was a part of. Um, and so internally, we have what we call a checkoff program. And that allowed people to donate money to aftercare. The, before that, there was never really a good mechanism through the breed registry to do that. So we added that. It was a very simple change, but it made a big difference. Um, and also got the names of those organizations kind of out there in front of people so that they were reminded that, oh, when my horse is done racing, it has some options about what it can mm -hmm. do. Um, and then we started the Thoroughbred Incentive Program, which is our sport horse uh, program we developed to recognize and reward thoroughbreds that are in a second career, whether that's competition, therapeutic riding, recreational riding, just your horse that you got that you really love, any of those. We tried to make sure that we covered everything from A to Z. It started really as a competition program. Um, we had awards at about 150 horse shows the first year and then two annual awards. And now this year we're going to have 
awards about 1500 horse shows. We still have the two annual awards. Uh, we have a year end awards program, a, comp a non competition recreational riding program, the championship horse shows. Um, and so it's, it's grown really fast. This is the 10th year hmm. of the program. And it's, it's been really rewarding to see kind of how much it's grown, especially looking back 10 years seems like a long time, but then when you think about the shift that we made, it really is kind of a short time. Um, and then we also have Thoroughbred Connect, which is uh, trying to get horses placed with people who might want them. So if you mm -hmm. saw a horse at the racetrack and you're like, man, I really love that horse's name or wow, I love, you know, he's really cute. You can attach your name to that horse. So then when the horse is done racing, the owner can contact you to let you know that the horse is now available for a second career. And then we also, the Jockey Club, are part of the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance formation. And that's an a organization that's committed to um, accrediting organizations that provide services, whether it's retraining, rehabilitation, retirement for thoroughbreds, and then fundraising for and giving grants to those organizations. So I'm very fortunate to also be a part of that organization. And that's another one that the growth has just been pretty amazing to see, um, again, how much professional organizations are doing the retraining and, and that they're really giving other organizations something to strive for and that we're able to, as an industry, support those organizations. So, sorry, long-winded answer of saying yeah. team effort, but no, some of them okay. were, um, <laughs> some of them I created, and but there was always for sure uh, um, lots of cheerleaders and support behind them, for sure. How old are the horses when you say like they go into aftercare? At what age are they usually? So it varies, um, you know, the, some of the thoroughbreds that are in race training don't ever make it to the track. So they might, the, the owners might decide, well, this one's probably not going to be a race horse. So they might get placed before they're even really started. And so those could be two-year-olds. Okay. Uh, the majority of them are going to be probably three, four, five-year-old horses. And so it's, you know, when you think about other breeds, that's when a lot of horses training just starting. So we as thoroughbred kind of advocates like to, to remind folks that, you know, these horses, they're three, four or five years old, but man, they've seen a lot. They've mm -hmm. been trailered all over the place. You know, they've been in a stall, they've been turned out. So it's, they kind of do come with a little bit of an advantage. Um, we like to say anyway, um, because they do have a lot of training as a young horse they and do. they're still eligible to do a lot of the young horse programs. If you're an eventer, for example, you know, they can do the YEH, FEH programs because they're still about that age um, as well. So uh, that it's, there's a wide variety. We do also have some more horses that race until they're nine or 10 years old, you know, get lots of starts and then retire and, um, can still go on to do another career as well. So, mm -hmm. so what are typical, like second careers for those horses? I know we talked a little bit about eventing and, um, uh, the, um, oh shoot, I lost it. <laughs> I know we talked <laughs> about the eventing and then, um, the, Oh my gosh. <laughs> it came to me again. I'll say I'll save you and just tell you what we've got horses with the words in that might Thank be. Thank you. So, you know, we like to say that thoroughbreds are versatile and they can do really anything. Um, where I'd say for the most part, people think of the typical disciplines that they're doing is gonna be hunters, jumpers, mm -hmm. eventing, dressage. They're probably kind of the big four where you're gonna see people who are interested in the thoroughbred and and that's kind of their more traditional look. You know, but we also have lots of thoroughbreds doing polo and polo cross. Um, so mm -hmm. particularly the smaller horses are very popular for those sort of competitions. Um, and then we have a lot more horses and it grows all the time that are doing Western, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's barrel racing or ranch riding. Uh, there's a lot more versatile kind of disciplines. It doesn't just have to be cutting and reining. There's a lot of other options for horses that maybe don't have that necessarily the the cow sense that you might think that a quarter horse has, although some of them do, but there are lots of other options um, for folks who do want to ride Western that we're hoping will maybe make them think, well, maybe I'll try a thoroughbred um, because there's, you know, they're such great horses and we think that they can do all of those things. Uh, we also do have thoroughbreds that are doing um, some of the other disciplines that are maybe not as uh, well-known like working equitation and some of the games and all those things. So um, we, have a lot of different disciplines represented. The majority of them are going to be those main four that we talked about at the beginning. We also have thoroughbreds that are doing therapeutic riding um, and also 
just therapy of horsemanship in general. So not necessarily being ridden, but, but used in programs that are helping veterans or children um, and senior citizens and adults. Um, and we really love the option of having the horses that maybe don't need to be ridden because we do have some thoroughbreds that when they retire, they're not necessarily able to go on to a competitive second career, but if they can be useful in helping others and they're also then, you know, being used in a program that is rewarding for them because they get to be brushed on and loved mm -hmm. on for you know their lives. That's a great, great opportunity for some of the horses coming off the track that maybe can't do the jumping and, and those sorts of things. So, and then of course we have lots of trail riders, um, particularly when COVID happened, um, we saw a major uptick in the number of recreational riding logs that we were getting because people mm -hmm. were just out there enjoying their horses. Um, and so that was super fun to see because we asked every time we get a log, for their hours, we ask for photographs. So seeing photos coming in from all over the country is really fun to see. And as a recreational rider myself, that's sort of like my, oh, I want to go to that place. Can I come ride with you? You know, <laughs> like then send in pictures from wine country in California or yeah. Montana in the mountains or, you know, the beach. It's like, okay, I want to go do all those things with my horse too. Um, and so we share all those photos. And I think that also then gets some more people interested in, well, maybe even if I do compete my horse, maybe it'd be fun to take them and do some other things. So that was really one of the things that came out of COVID, I think, was we saw a lot more people just out enjoying their horses um, mm -hmm. and they get rewarded for it through our program. So, so yeah. how does somebody become a part of the program or get involved? Sure. So um, any thoroughbred is eligible to participate in TIP as long as they're registered with the Jockey Club. Um, in some cases, there's also some foreign horses that are imported. And as long as they're registered with their, their stud book in their foreign country, then they're eligible as well. And you just have to apply for a tip number. And then um, there's all kinds of programs, you know, that you can participate in. There's shows, although with as many shows as there are on the country, we obviously can't cover all of them. So if there aren't shows near someone, they can participate in some of our other programs like our year-end awards program or the recreational riding program and things like that. So um, the website is probably the best place to start. Um, and that's tjctip.com. Very cool. cool. Mom, was yep. Miller, um, uh, was he one of the off-the-track thoroughbreds? He was. That's what I was going to say. Is probably one of my most beloved horses came off the track. And then, um, and he was a thoroughbred, of course, you know, and just the best hunter jumper, you know, yeah. just boy zigged and zagged together, you know, it was wonderful. <laughs> so my question is though, like if someone were looking for a thoroughbred and the horses are in the tip program, um, do they come to you and say, Hey, I'm looking for this kind of a horse, or do you just have the listing of horses or how would say, I wanted to get a horse again, that's kind of that, you know same type of horse what what would I do to try to find that horse again sure so there's a few options um and the the tip program isn't necessarily the best or at least our website isn't necessarily the best avenue we don't have a, a great um way to find horses now if you're looking for a specific horse you can look it up and say oh you know I love this horse and now I know that he's doing a second career but there are a few um resources for folks that are looking for horses um the Thurbert Aftercare Alliance that I mentioned earlier, um, they have a list on their website of um, all of the organizations that are providing aftercare program for the thoroughbreds. So those horses would be in retraining at those organizations. And most of them do have the horses listed on their website, so you can go and check them out. Um, there's also on the Retired Racehorse Project, which is another organization, and some of you guys might be familiar with them. They have uh, the thoroughbred makeover that happens in Kentucky every year. Uh, they have a couple of great resources on their website. Um, one is just a listing of trainers and um, retrainers. So in addition to the aftercare organizations that are like not-for-profits, there are a lot of uh, people who just specialize in getting horses off the track and retraining them and then selling them as part of their business. And so there's a list of those on there. And then there's an app called OTTB United that the Retired Resource Project is a part of. And that is a buy and sell and transport app that you can go and just kind of look and see who's got thoroughbreds for sale. So that's probably your best um, three options there. There are of course, you know, always Facebook and all of those options. Um, and you can also go right to the track. There are several 
Um, we, they're called Cantor for the most part, although there are some other uh, listing services. So there's folks that go to the backside of the racetrack and get information on horses that are ready to retire. And then they post them on their website so that the people can find them and they can hopefully uh, find a new home and a new career. I just wanted to say too, that if any, people listening, if they haven't had a thoroughbred before, sometimes it can be a little intimidating because you think a horse off the track and sometimes they can be, you know, hot. But the thing is, is that my, you know, the best horse, I, I had a few horses off the track though, you know, the, the best horse I had was, you know, one from the track and he actually, I know it sounds kind of funny. People thought he was a quarter horse and he <laughs> wasn't, you know, but um, you know, to really check it out because these horses have a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. And, and they're really, they're wonderful horses to, to work with. So, you know, don't pass it by if you're a little concerned about, you know, a thoroughbred, but oh my goodness, how versatile they are. So I just want to encourage people, this is a good program and you should, if you're looking for a horse to have that second career, you know, for that horse, give that horse that opportunity because they just can be the best horses. So. Well, thank you very much. I couldn't have, I didn't pay her anything to say that, but I couldn't have said <laughs> better myself. That was, uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do with all these programs is just yeah. remind folks or show them that, you know, you, the thoroughbreds should be not on your list of things that you don't want. They should be, you know, considered just like any other breed. And mm -hmm. I think one of the benefits of going through like an aftercare organization is they get the horse and they're able to kind of do some retraining and get an idea of its personality and get an idea of its um, capabilities. So then that's a good way to sort of not as quite intimidating as just going to the racetrack. You can go to this organization and say, here's what I'm looking for. I want to, you know, uh, which we have this a lot. I want a gray horse, <laughs> that gray gelding that can do, you know, two six hunters. And, and, you know, they can help you find that whether they have it, currently, or they can put you on a list to be contacted once they get one of those. Um, but also then they can show you all these other horses and maybe you'll find one that you like just as much, but they get a great, um, that's a great way to sort of introduce into the thoroughbred world. That's a little bit less intimidating than getting a straight off the track course, um, you know, from the racetrack itself. So another benefit of the aftercare organizations too, and I don't mean to tattle on them so much, but if the horse doesn't work out, they'll take it back, which is a huge mm -hmm. plus you know, instead of the horse ending up in a bad situation, yes. because maybe it is too quirky for the person or too strong, you know, whatever the, whatever happens, they'll take them back and then try to place them in a better spot. So I think mm. that is one other sort of safety net. That's a good part of working with some of these organizations that do this as um, a job essentially. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I like too, that you said mentioned, you know, these horses have been through a lot. They've seen a lot in trailering alone is hard to, you know, like train horses, you know, for different things. And I think that's something that I would have never thought of if you were looking at yeah. a horse like this. So that's really good. Yeah. And that, you know, they have reputations for being hot, which are sometimes justified. My horse thinks pitchforks are going to kill him <laughs> still now, even though he sees them almost a daily basis. But at the same time, you know, they've been in front of crowds and they've been in and yeah. out of trailers and they've been with a lot of people in different barns and so there are, I think with any horses, they all have their quirky things, yeah. but um, if you know what they are, then you can work with them. Like for example, thoroughbreds are almost never at the racetrack putting cross ties. So cross ties are pretty standard at most barns. That's something you have to know before you try to put your horse in cross ties and then wonder why they're like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> it's, you know, they're usually tied in their stall. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of those things that are um, good to know when you're getting into um, a thoroughbred that's recently off the track is there's some things that you might think are normal, but it's not necessarily their normal. So is it pretty affordable to do this as like, you know, somebody who would want to purchase a horse like this? So most of the adoption organizations that um, are accredited, a lot of them have adoption fees that are $1,000 or under. Um, and so they do try to make it as affordable as possible. Um, but they also do have pretty intense um, application processes mm -hmm. in order to, to adopt the horses. Okay. So it's a li little bit of give and take. You know, if you go to a, a seller, they might, you're going to do maybe a pre-purchase and, and they are just going to sell you the horse, but at an adoption organization, they're going to do a background to get some information from your vet and your farrier and where you're going to keep the horse and what do you want to do with it and those sorts of things to make sure it's a good fit. 
And, and so then I think when the adoption fees maybe seem less than a, a for-profit organization or a for-profit seller might sell them for, part of the reason is because they're hoping that it's going to be sort of a long-term home for the horse as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, you don't quite know what you're getting into. <laughs> and I think that says a lot about the horses too. They, they are good horses. They're wonderful horses. And I think it says a lot, you know, about the thoroughbred horse that, you know, to have a good home and take this horse and, you know, that has so much potential and go with it that way. That says a lot. Absolutely. And that, you know, they, there's, everybody wants a different thing in a horse and all these horses, we like to say there's a thoroughbred out there for everybody. You just maybe have to find the right one. <laughs> Very cool. Well, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll enter our next segment, Canter Banter. Our next segment, Canter Banter, is brought to you by Ram Horse Fencing and Stalls, the one-stop shop for your horse farm. Ram is family-owned and operated and has been in business for over 30 years. We welcome you to call in and speak with an expert about your next project today at 866-653-8984. Again, that's 866-653-8984. Do you love horses and live the equestrian lifestyle? Be sure to check out our brand new blog at www.yourhorsefarm.com. We publish three posts per week and feature a free printable equine checklist every month. Yourhorsefarm.com is a great equine online resource, so be sure to share with all the horse lovers in your life. And remember, laugh much and ride often. So we announced today, actually, that uh, our tip championships, which is our our kind of final show, is going to be taking place in Aiken, South Carolina in October. And then we also have a second show that's going to be in Kentucky, also in October, back to back. I like to do all the things at one time. <laughs> um, but it kind of reminded me when we were talking about the canter banner of our the first time that we kind of did an all thoroughbred show. Um, we partnered with uh, an organization here in Kentucky to do one. And we thought, well, we're probably going to get a lot of people and it'll be fine, but we can do this in one day. So um, <laughs> we did it in one day, except that we were... Uh, by the time we got to the kind of classic classes at the end, which were the money stakes, the hunter derby and the jumper stakes, I think we ended at about two 30 in the morning. Oh um, and I was, there was a lot of people that, that stuck around. And so it was great, but it was, it was amazing to see that many thoroughbreds, but we certainly underestimated how long all of those things were going to take. <laughs> um, and so the next morning, my friend who we were doing the show and I, we had to take down all the jumps and move them and stuff. And there, obviously we weren't doing that at four in the morning when we were done. So we were back there the next day and we got through it until the very, very end. And we had this wooden box of like metal jump cups that probably weighed a hundred pounds, pretty heavy, but like, you know, we could have done it under normal circumstances, but it was on the back of a truck and we had to lift it down and put it somewhere else. And we both went to lift it and you could just see the like defeat. happening. <laughs> the people who were helping with the jumps were like, we'll get it. <laughs> it was a long weekend. It was amazing, but it was, we had reached the, the end of our rope by, by that point. So um, just being able to see kind of, again, how far we've come, that was the mm-hmm. first show, you know, and now we are doing two three day horse shows and um, we'll probably have, 500 horses coming, which is really awesome. That's incredible. That's awesome. I would just have to say at that point, for you not being able to lift that, horse people are pretty enduring. So you were tired. (laughs) We were, yeah. Right. We don't give up and we don't say we're tired. You guys were tired. So it was, yes. We had moved a whole jump, two jump courses and everything else. And it was just that darn box of jump cups Mm -hmm. that was just done. Right, right. Yeah, a lot of endurance there. So good for you. (laughs) Yes, for sure, for sure. We hope you enjoyed listening to our podcast and encourage you to share with all your equestrian family and friends. You can tune into the Late Night Riders podcast show every Friday night. Each episode will be uploaded exclusively on YouTube where you can subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all of our latest shows. Do you have a topic you'd like us to discuss? We want to hear from you. You may email us at podcast at or feel free to leave a comment below. Thank you again for listening.